You know, it's Oz Music Month this month, Beck, mm-hmm. when the ABC. And last week, if you were tuning in, we were talking a lot about uh, this sort of new Indigenous scene of all these breakthrough artists that are having tremendous commercial success singing in language. And I thought it would be interesting this week to step back in time uh, to the, the 1980s uh, and... A, a character by the name of Neil Murray, who's a poet, an author, a composer, and is described as a reconciliation whisperer. Now, Neil, I guess you'd describe his music as a bit folky, but he's also had a hand in the kind of Oz rock pub scene and done lots of travelling. Amazing life story. You might have heard of Warumpi Band, and he was one of the founding members of Warumpi Band, uh, Indigenous rock band, one of the first Indigenous rock bands, and he basically formed this band in Central Australia really got this idea of the Indigenous rock band off the ground in the 80s. So we're going to hear from Neil Murray today. But first up, we're going to hear a bit of a taste of a rumpy band. This is a really cute song. It's reminded me a bit of the jailhouse rock. It's called Jalangaroo Pak Arnu. Let's have a listen. <laughs> to pick us up, to kick us off even, Jalangura Pakano from the Warumpi Band. Rachel Lucas is with me this morning. Today on Backbeat we are talking all about the music of Neil Murray and he joins us now too. Good morning, Neil. Uh, morning, Rachel. Now, where were you born? I was born in Ararat in Zapparon country, Western Victoria. Well, you obviously grew up on a farm, is that right? Yeah, I did. It was my great-grandfather's sold settlement farm for service in the First World War. It was only a small block. It's between Lake Bolak and Wycliffe, and about 50 k south of our... Yeah. How did you first encounter Indigenous culture? Well, I think it, the first time I even realised that there were people here before Europeans was on my grandfather's farm and picking up, you know, blackfellow stones in the paddock and him showing them to me, grindstones and axe heads, and explaining that they belonged to people that used to live there before. And that set my young mind in wondering and... and uh, I was really puzzled as to why they'd gone, you know. That kind of set feeling in motion. And then I think when I was in high school, we had a Mornington Island dance group come and perform at the school. And I remember jumping up and, and enjoying them in, in the Braga dance. And I think that was the other pivotal memory as well. And that's 
kind of fueled my desire to want to find Indigenous people and, and be with them and learn from them. And so, yeah, it's a short story anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's pretty extraordinary. I'm sure you've had people ask you this a thousand times, but I'm assuming this is like the late 70s. I guess Australia was coming of age and people culturally were looking at Australian ideas and Australian identity, but it's pretty extraordinary for a, a country bloke to pursue this, this interest. And you became a teacher, is that right? Well, I was trained as a secondary art and craft teacher and I did teach for one year in Victoria before I moved to the NT. I didn't take up a teaching initially, I had an outsourced job, no, but then I ended up getting a job with the NT education department and worked teaching on outstations in a bilingual education program at Papunya and out, and outstations west including the new community of Kintor which was just starting when I, when I was working there. How did your musical interest come about? Did you play guitar as a kid? I didn't get on the guitar until about 13 or 14. I, I did get a drum kit when I was about 10. A small drum kit. I didn't have a kick drum with it but just a cymbal and a hi-hat and a tambourine on the side and um, I used to play along with the radio on that but even from an early age, you know, from about six or seven or onwards, my grandfather used to encourage me to sing because he was a keen singer. And um, I'd sing singing Beatles songs at the top of my voice sort of thing, you know. So it really goes back to that. And I can remember a time before television when we used to go to friends' and relatives' houses and have sing-alongs around the piano and stuff. So that was kind of formative to us, I guess. So you did a bit of travelling. Why did you decide to settle in Papunya? I'd had a trip to the Territory in 78 and gone to... I was Bamili or Barunga it's called now and had some encounters there and I was looking for a place where people had their language and law still intact and, and a friend of mine who had been a teacher at Lake Bolak where I went to high school with, I'd been corresponding with and he was at Papunya. I'd been up and visited there in 79. I was going to go back to the top end but then he said there was a job going there driving a store truck for our station. So in January 1980, I packed up all my stuff. I was teaching in Robinvale at the time, which, and I had significant encounters with Indigenous people there too, by the way. But anyway, I loved the country and it didn't seem as wild or it was more natural than, than Victoria, where I'd come from. It was farming country, but out there, there was something remote and, and idyllic, and I was just drawn to a uh, prospect of going to a, a place where Indigenous people still had their language and law and very strongly and um, I just felt there was something I had to do. I felt it was necessary for me to understand my place in this country and that I just intuitively felt I had to sit down with the Aboriginal people and learn from them to get an understanding. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it was pretty vague at the time, but I just was hell-bent on getting to the Territory and, and working and living in a community. So when a mate told me that there was a job going, I went up and sort of applied for it, which was just sitting down in a meeting with a bunch of old men and, and not understanding what they were saying. But they agreed to put me on for a three-month trial and I sort of went all right and so I stayed. And How did they take to you at first? you just got to prove your worth and, and you've got to remember that there's been more Europeans go through a community like Papunya than the total population to support it. So, mm. you know, it takes a while for, for relationships to develop. But when they do, they're kind of lifelong, you know. They don't ever stop and... Um, and, yeah, I just learnt and listened and I got an understanding of the language. And you know, I was chosen to do this store truck driving job because it was too hard for an Aboriginal boy to do it because the pressure on him to give the food away and for free to his family was too much. It was even hard enough for me to do it, you know. Mm. It was a lot of humbug. And that the cash, the checks, the pension checks or sit-down money checks and sell produce off the back of the truck and uh, try and balance the books, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it was a really exciting time but because the main thing was I'd only been in Papunya a week and Sammy Butcher turned up, knocked on my door. He said, you got a guitar? I said, yeah. He wanted to have a look at it. I could see he could play, you know. I said, geez, what a jam, you know. So that and the football and stuff, I just uh, was mixing with the young blokes and just uh, having a great time, you know. And they just um, treated me the same and they wanted me to be involved and stuff and um, they just invited me to perform and play with them and jam and whatnot and play free and whatnot. <laughs> So, so yeah, that's, that's well from there. That's yeah. pretty much how Warumpi Rumpy Band started. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for Sammy Butcher coming around and inviting me, he's he's a wonderful, generous spirit. He's always very been, been very inclusive. You know, we played together, and we enjoyed playing together, and like music and that. And John and he was terrific. And were they all into uh, country right. music? Oh, he was play. He could play country, rock and roll, anything. He just learned from tapes and things. He was a terrific talent, and um, it was a wonderful energy when we played together. You know, he could play bass, guitar, drums, anything. So young blokes chucked in money and the, and we just got a bit of gear and and by the end of 1980, late 1980, this, this bloke from the top end turned up, you know, said he was a singer man and uh, he was also came there and married Sammy's sister, so there was no way he wasn't going to be in the band. You know? That was that was George, front man, you know. So. I've always looked at these 
music videos that were done, which are real sort of little documentary snapshots of life there for you at that time. And it just always looked as if you were having so much fun in that scene, going from town to town in the music videos, playing shows, bush mechanic style in the back of the youth. There's so much joy that comes out of those early videos. And I remember as a kid looking at it thinking, gee, I've never seen this on TV, that there's this whole world out there of Aboriginal culture and they're having a good time because in the media... Uh, it was it was still very negative, and it was such a contrast to see you know this community in your music videos of that time. Was it fun? Like, did, was was oh, that your absolutely. memory? Absolutely, absolutely. We had the best fun these days. I don't think bands do it like that anymore. We just go around the nation, just like community shows and stuff. You know, and people supported us. As Sammy Butcher says now, we were the people's band. You know. We were really not in the mainstream at all. We had a cult following it, but I mean, we're probably bigger now. We're known more now than what we ever were when we were up and going. And, yeah, uh, it was. A, it was a wonderful spirit, you know. I mean, we could just radio, telephone a community and say we'll be there in a couple of days, and make rough posters in the school, you know, with the old <laughs> just setting a photo, writing a uh, printer thing, and it was a great uh, enthusiasm, exuberance, and we'll never tour like that again, really. And then as we got more well known. We stepped up in production values and we started playing in the cities and that. But those early tours were all through communities and the Kimleys and the Territory. Is there one WA. gig that stands out to you as being the most memorable? There's many, you know, and there's some disasters too. <laughs> <laughs> but just when we were really firing and, and, and George was really on song, and I mean, we could really transform a crowd. And just It's just a delight. And, I mean, some of the shows we did in Darwin at the Nightcliff Hotel were, were transcendent and, you know, big shows we did in front of Midnight All and stuff, and we held our own. And I couldn't think of one particular show. But it was just always a delight to see mixed crowds there, you know, and all blending in. It, it, it just seemed to me uh, for a while there were a force of nature and a force for positive social change, you know, mm. and um, for equality between races and things. And um, we saw it happening in the crowds in front of us, people mixing really well together. And just the joy and, and the, the celebration of shared humanity. Just felt this is Australia, this is the country we want to live in. You know, that's what we were seeing in the, in the audiences in front of us. If you've just joined us, you're on ABC Gippsland and Goulburn Murray. I'm Bex Simmons. Rachel Lucas is with me and we're talking to Neil Murray about uh, forming the Warumpi Band. We might listen to the song Blackfella, Whitefella now because it really just sticks with what Neil's just told us.
the Warumpi Band with black fella, white fella. Neil Murray from the Warumpi Band joins us this morning. He's chatting to Rachel Lucas and myself here on ABC Gippsland and Goulburn Murray. What kind of memories does that song bring back for you, Neil? Oh, the memories I was just telling you about, seeing audiences, you know, mixed crowds, just really enjoying each other in the same space, you know. I remember particularly um, in front of me one time when we were playing that song, um, but a little skinny white guy... Uh, small white guy with glasses and a big Islander guy next to him, you know, dark colour. And the Islander fell and picked him up and hugged him. Oh. <laughs> and back down on the floor and then the white bloke like, started dancing. <laughs> oh. it, was, it was the funniest thing, you know. And did you sing in language? Yeah, we did, yeah. Well, like, you played Jail and Warren Buckingham earlier. That's in words song about getting out of jail. Mm. And, of course, George also sang songs in his own language. How much there's a few songs, well, Warrior, the, the Verse of Tim Warrior in Gulmach, and, and there's some songs on Too Much Humbug um, that are in Gulmach um, as well, like Dilpun and uh, Mother mm. So, And we did quite a few songs in language, and Dalangor and Pakanu was actually the first ever commercially released pop rock single sung in, in an Indigenous language from this continent. It was the first uh, commercially released single, mm. apparently, in an Indigenous language. Since then, there's been an explosion of, of artists who have embraced their own language and, and used it. You know, just most notably Gulamal, I suppose. Yeah. Well, you really pioneered uh, this whole movement, and obviously Midnight All were very inspired by it. And I was really interested to see that you you were pretty much responsible for Christine Arnoux's career, but from what I read, she was a backup singer for you when you recorded My Island Home. Is that right? She didn't sing on the Warren's Band recorded version. That was released in 87. I didn't meet Christine until the early 90s. But I was looking for a backing singer, and I knew a lot of people at the Aboriginal Island Dance School out in Glebe, and I was recommended to check her out, and uh, she had a terrific voice, and I just asked her if she'd want to sing on some recordings I was doing. This was when I had my solo album, second solo album. Yeah, she came and and sang on the recordings and, and then I said, well, do you want to sing some of these parts when we play live? I was playing in Sydney with the Rainmakers and, and I remember the very first gig at the Hopeton Hotel, the crowd loved it, you know, and uh, they wanted to hear more of her and I said, you should sing a couple of your songs yourself and she didn't know what to sing and I said, oh, I've got that warranty band song, Mile and Home, we could make that work for you, just change a few words here and then. So we started doing it, sharing, sharing verses and that. And so it was inevitable she'd get her own record deal and my manager at the time basically took her to Mushroom and she got a deal and then David Brody was producing her first album and, and I had a couple of other songs I wrote, wrote for her that were on that album. She did her, her version of Mile and Home and of course I think having promotion and management behind her um, it broke through into the mainstream and uh, that's the version that most people know. Yeah, well who could forget her singing that at the opening ceremony of the 2000 oh, yeah, Olympics? Absolutely. That would have been it. Yeah. Because that's your song, you wrote that. I wrote it, yeah, what? I wrote it initially for George to sing because I was always trying to get a good song in English that he, he'd really want to sing, you know, get his teeth into. And I just, I was missing my own home country at the time, but I, I had the feeling for that, And but I'd just been and visited his home country for the first time and uh, lived off the land for four or five days, you know, turtle hunting, fishing, and the whole, the whole nine yards was a boyhood dream come to fruition. Then I was down south and the song came to me on the bus one night travelling from Melbourne to Sydney. Just an exceptional feeling of longing for a place where you really belong. The chorus popped into my head and I thought, oh, I've got to write this for, for George to sing, you know, because he'd been living in the desert a long time. <laughs> he must miss that saltwater country. So uh, that's how it came about. And I, I demoed it and took it back to George and played it to him and he'd just give it the thumbs up and he said, that's, that's number one. That's talking about my life. So I knew he'd, he'd want to sing it. He made it his own song then when he sang it. So that's how it came about. Now well, everybody sings it, of course. Yeah, it's like an unofficial happy. Australian anthem. We sang it in the in the school yeah. choir in primary school. Oh. Sorry to yeah, yeah. <laughs> show my age. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> I'm amazed how it's just taken off. I just understand it. I wouldn't have expected it. But... Well, let's have a little yeah, bit of a like. listen to it, hey, because I'm sure people probably don't realise that there there was an original version of it. And look, Neil Murray, thank you so much for speaking to us this morning. Um, this one will oh, take yeah. us up to 11 o'clock, but it's been absolutely fantastic to meet you over the phone and, and to really get to get an inside story. We try to do as much research as we can online, but you can't get the full story. And just to hear those anecdotes from you have been absolutely fantastic. So yeah. thanks for All taking right. the time out of your morning. And also, you know, you've had a pretty amazing solo career and we should mention that you have 
a, a recent album released last year, Blood and Longing. You've released about eight solo albums and you tour around Australia still very active with your writing, writing books, poetry, the works. So you're like a modern day Banjo Patterson almost. But uh, let's have a well, listen yeah. to My Island Home from the right Wonder Band from 87. Six years I've been in the desert And every night I dream of the sea To say home is where you find it Will this place ever satisfy me For I come from the soul Waiting for me in the evening when the dry wind blows from the hills and across the plain. I close my eyes and I'm standing in a boat on the sea again, and I'm holding that long. I'm close now to where it must be My island home is waiting for me Now I'm out here west of Alice Springs With a wife and a family And my island home My island home My island home Is waiting for me In the evening to drive From the hills and across the plain, I close my eyes and I'm standing in a boat on the sea again, and I'm holding that long tail spear, and I feel I'm close now. The original, my island home. From the Warumpi Band, written by Neil Murray, of course, who we're speaking to this morning. And it's an absolute pleasure to meet him. I've had a couple of texts through. Thanks so much for those. One says, Neil Murray is the best. First saw him at Apollo Bay Music Festival many years ago. I'm really looking forward to live gigs again soon. Uh, and another one saying, I just really love Black Fella, White Fella. It's a great song from Lisa. Thank you very much for that. We're coming up to 11 o'clock. I'm Beck Simmons. I'll be back with you from 10 o'clock tomorrow.